world around us is lost and dying, and without Christ we'll spend eternity in hell. And we know that the answer for sinners is Christ, only Christ. Apart from Christ, there is no salvation. Not in anyone else's name is salvation offered. So we get the concepts, but do we get the concern? Do we convey the concern? Do we preach the gospel with a sense of love and concern and compassion for sinners? That's what it means to be a a true servant of God. You You have the heart of God. You reflect the heart of God as you share the Word of God. It's sad, but it's true to say that sometimes you hear people preach the gospel in such a way that you wonder if they even believe it themselves. They have the information, but has the truth that they're proclaiming, has it really settled in on their own heart and mind so that they understand the gravity of it and therefore the urgency of it? I think this is a great thing for all of us to examine ourselves about. As we share the gospel... Are we conveying the heart of God? His desire for sinners to be reconciled to Him. The desire in God for the salvation of sinners. And I'll continue to exhort us because we are a church that believes in the sovereignty of God in salvation. We believe in that with all of our hearts. God is absolutely sovereign in the matter of salvation. Salvation is of the Lord. He alone explains sinners turning from their sins and trusting in His Son. I believe that regeneration precedes faith, and apart from the new birth, no one believes the gospel. But dear ones, if our understanding of the sovereignty of God has made us cold towards sinners, I say to you, you have a diseased understanding of the sovereignty of God. In the Lord Jesus Christ, we see sovereign God in human flesh. He wept over the city of Jerusalem. And most of what we learn about the sovereignty of God in straightforward, plain terms in the New Testament comes from this man who could wish himself accursed on behalf of his kinsmen according to the flesh. Such a passion he has for the salvation of fellow Jews. Have we been gripped by that kind of concern for sinners? So, servants of God, strive together with God for souls. Now, tonight... We look at the second and the third points beginning at verse 3. We put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, stop there. Second thought, servants of God strive for a testimony that is godly. You strive together for souls. Now listen, if that really is your concern, if your concern is for the salvation of sinners, then you will also be concerned about whether your life commends that gospel or gets in the way of that gospel. If I believe the gospel and if I want to be faithful in the ministry of reconciliation and communicate the gospel message to the world faithfully, then what I fear, what I would would count as, as one of my greatest heartbreaks is the thought that my life is getting in the way of that message. I don't want my life to be a contradiction when it comes to the gospel message. I want my life to be a commendation. Or if we think about that that description in verse 4, as servants of God, I don't want my life to be a contradiction of that title. If someone looked at my life and said, now is that what it means to be a servant of God? I don't want that to be a negative thing in their mind. I want want my life to be a commendation of what it means to be a servant of God. Paul says that's his concern. 
striving together with God for souls, the very next thing he says is, we put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. See, I want to be sure I'm not a contradiction. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way. Not a contradiction, but a commendation. It's what he desires to be. If you have a concern for souls, you're going to have a concern for your testimony. Does your life speak well of the gospel? I want you just examine yourself for a moment, draw a circle around you, and ask yourself that question. Does your life, the way you're living right now, does it speak well of the gospel? Does it commend the gospel? Now, we need to be careful how we think through that don't we? We need to be very careful how we think through that because if we're not careful, we can think through it in a way that is unrealistic and in fact takes to ourselves a sense of guilt that is not appropriate. So let's think through that for just a moment. First of all, we need to understand that the servants of God are being sanctified by God. We are sinners saved by the grace of God, are we not? And we still battle with sin, do we not? And so there is no minister and there is no member of any church that has arrived on this side of glorification, on this side of heaven. We all battle with sin every day. We all confess our sins every day. In fact, this is one of the evidences that you, in fact, are saved, that you acknowledge your sin before God. You see it. And you agree with God about it. You say the same about your sin as God says about it. And so you are a confessor. You're an ongoing repenter. You confess your sins regularly. Well, you can't be confessing your sins regularly if you think you don't have any. In fact, a faithful servant of God is a humble servant of God. And a humble servant of God has an accurate view of himself or herself, a biblical view of yourself. And if you measure yourself by the Word of God, by the law of God, you're going to see that you come short. You're far from completely conformed to the image of Jesus. So true servants of God fail, they sin, they need forgiveness, they need patience. So we're not talking about a sinless standard. And if you're not living to that standard, you're a poor testimony for the gospel. No, that's not the right mindset. There's something else we need to be clear about, and that is the servants of God in this world are always going to be lightning rods for controversy. Okay? Faithful servants of God reveal the divide that exists in human beings. Paul's already talked about this in the second chapter of this letter, chapter 2, verse 15, when he wrote, for we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death, to the other, a fragrance from life to life. I mean, some people are going to love you, Christian, and some people are going to hate you. What I'm trying to say to you is to be a, a good testimony of the gospel is not the same as saying everyone loves you, everyone thinks highly of you, everyone sings your praises, no one would ever say anything negative about you. In fact, Jesus said, beware if all men speak well of you. That's how they used to talk about the false prophets. That's how false prophets get talked about. I like what John MacArthur said about this. He said, it is an ironic truth that the preacher is often one of the most loved and respected of men, yet at the same time, one of the most hated and despised in his community. To those who believe the gospel he preaches, he is a revered spiritual father, mentor, and teacher. He proclaims to them the divine truth, encourages them, gives them hope, and instructs them in applying God's word. But to those who reject his message... His is the judgmental voice of conviction, irritation, and agitation. To them, he is a troublemaker. 
We see that, don't we, in Scripture over and over again? This was true of the prophets. This was the experience of one we've studied about recently in the Gospel of Mark, John the Baptist. This was Paul's experience, as we're going to see here in just a few moments, in these very verses. He wasn't loved by everyone, received by everyone, praised by everyone. That wasn't his experience. But above all, this wasn't our Lord's experience. And he's already told us in advance it's not going to be any different for any of us. Luke 6, blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you. Listen, and spurn your name as evil. Now that's strong, isn't it? Give me Richard's name. That's evil. That's strong. Next statement, this is where we have to be careful in our thinking as well, on account of the Son of Man. (laughs) Not because you're obnoxious, certainly not because you're living a sinful lifestyle, but it ought to be on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. We have a hard time practicing that, don't we? When someone criticizes us, when someone slanders us, when someone lies about us because not of unfaithfulness, but faithfulness to Christ, it's hard, isn't it, to leap for joy? But that's what the Lord says. Leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for so their fathers did to the prophets. Do you think this is important for us to understand as we think about what he's saying here? I don't want my life to be a contradiction to the gospel. Do you think it's important to bear this in mind? Can I give you one reason this is so practically important. Right now, I believe we are living in a time when the church, when I say the church, I'm talking about the church generic, when the church is at times buying into a mindset that you are going to win the culture by pandering to it. So we take worldly concepts, the world standard of what it means to be nice, what it means to be loving, what it means to be compassionate, what it means to be understanding, what it means to be tolerant. And then we try to live up to the world's definition of what those things mean, thinking that if they see how nice and tolerant and understanding and all the rest we are, then they'll see Jesus and love Jesus. Can I tell you, the standard for kindness and love and compassion is not this world standard. It's the standard of Scripture. And sometimes what the Bible defines as love, not sometimes, all the time, is very different than what this world defines as love. And biblical compassion is different than the world's standard of compassion. And biblical kindness is different than the world's standard of kindness. Even the book of Proverbs tells us that a friend will wound you when an enemy will kiss you. You you study the great servants of God on the pages of Scripture and throughout the history of the church, and you're going to find that they were emphatic when it came to what the truth is. They weren't vague. They didn't apologize for the truth. They didn't skirt around the truth. They didn't water down the truth. They were clear. Now, they spoke the truth in love, and as we're going to see in a moment, full of the Spirit. Therefore, the fruit of the Spirit ought to characterize our communication of the truth. We need to be clear on this point, that not being a contradiction doesn't mean perfection. That's the first thought. But neither does it mean that we're trying to to live up to this standard where no one's going to be be, uh, upset with us. No one's going to disapprove of us. No one's going to say anything bad about us. That's not the standard. What I'm saying is if we're going to really live this out, we've got to get rid of the counterfeits. Got to get rid of the confusion, the misunderstanding of what he's talking about. He tells us here what he's talking about. What does he mean he he, he seeks to to not, and by the way, this is emphatic in the Greek text, no obstacle whatsoever in anyone's way. He wants to make sure that he's not guilty of this in any way, verse 3, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. So how is he aiming at this? Verse 4, but as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, How? By great endurance in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger. 
I want to remove obstacles, he says. Proskope is the word. The Greek lexicon has this to say about that word, an occasion for taking offense or for making a misstep. As the su- succeeding purpose clause indicates, Christians are not to provide outsiders with any reason for finding fault with the Christian message, either because of conduct contrary to the cultural ethos or alleged undermining of morals. Faithful ministry is not careless. We're not just living careless lives, pleasing ourselves. Faithful ministry is not callous to the impact of our choices. We ought to understand that our choices are going to make an impact on others. Faithful ministry doesn't want to distract from Christ or the gospel or get in the way of people coming to faith in Christ. We need to put on sound doctrine. We need to adorn it. We need to live it out. Titus 2 would be a great place to start to study that. No, we don't want to contradict the message. We want to commend it. And what commends us? According to these verses, what commends us is how we live. What commends us is not a seminary degree. What commends us is not a reputation that we have somehow earned through ministry connections and our ministry degree and those sorts of things. What commends us is our upright living. This is what commends a minister of the gospel. And so Paul, as he talks about this commendation, we we can organize it into three groups. You want to commend the gospel? Here's how you do it. Number one, you're going to have to do this by enduring hardship. That first statement there, he says, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way. First thing he mentions, by great endurance by much endurance. And that really, that really informs everything else he talks about in the, in the descriptions that follow. You want one thing that really commends a faithful servant of God? They are characterized by endurance. That is, they continue. They stay at it. They bear up under all the difficulties that ministry brings. Faithful servants endure. What do they endure? Well, first of all, they endure what comes to them from the, from the sovereign hand of God in this world. We live in a fallen world. We're going to meet with difficulty just as a, as a, as a measure of course when it comes to the world we live in. And the first descriptions he uses speak of that kind of suffering. He says, in afflictions. Verse 4, hardships, calamities, afflictions, thalipsis, it's the word that, that speaks of tribulation, troubles, general troubles, the kinds of troubles that anybody deals with in the world. Faithful servants of God deal with trouble just like everybody else deals with trouble. But you watch their life, and in the midst of those tribulations and troubles and hardships, they persevere, they continue, they remain faithful, they don't change. They bear up under those tests. Those tribulations introduce them to hardships, the distress that comes through the troubles, the troubled, the the potentially troubled hearts that come through the troubles. They hold up under it. They continue in the midst of it. These are things inevitable in the world that we live in. You are going to meet with much tribulation, and you're going to meet at times with the heavy heart that comes along with those troubles. The third term is even stronger, the word translated calamities. In that word is the idea of narrowness, stressful, distressful circumstances, like you are are, are locked up in a situation. From the human point of view, it seems there's no way out. I mean, it's not just a hardship, it's a hardship. We meet with the normal kinds of hardships that everybody in the world meets with. Sometimes, watch a servant of God, they go through extreme testing. Do they stand up under that? Do they continue faithful in the midst of that, through that? 
So the first descriptions we can put in a category from the hand of God, just the providence of God, the sovereignty of God, these things come into your life. The second set of descriptions, these things I guess we could say, obviously everything is from the sovereign hand of God, comes by permission of the Lord. But the second category we could describe is coming from others, the hands of men. He says, beatings, imprisonments, riots. Beatings. Maybe someone here knows about this, but as far as I know, no one in this room, including me, has ever experienced that. A beating because of the gospel. But Paul knew about that, didn't he? He knew about that. And I don't know if anyone here has ever been imprisoned for the sake of the gospel, but Paul knew about that. Through beatings, he remained faithful, he endured. Through imprisonment, multiple imprisonments, he endured. Riots, preaching the gospel in the public square, the result, civil unrest. Uh, Uprisings, people wanting to kill you, stoning you, dragging you outside the city, leaving you as dead. He had experienced that. And yet you watch his life. He gets up and walks back into the city. He keeps on preaching. He keeps on ministering. He doesn't change. Sinless? No. Real? Yes. Faithful? Yes. Enduring? Yes. Much endurance. Great endurance. You watch the regular, everyday sorts of things that come from the hand of God? Faithful. You watch... Persecution from the hands of people faithful. But then there's a a third set that's very interesting. You could say that this comes from his own hand. These are things that he chooses because he desires to be faithful. Verse 5, he says, labors, sleepless nights, hunger. Labors, working to the point of exhaustion. Paul, who makes you do that? Who makes you keep going to the point that you wear yourself out? Who chooses that? He does. Who would put you into situations where you could could say that you have to endure sleepless nights in the way of ministry? Who made that choice? He did. Faithfulness, even to the point where at times it meant he went without food, hunger, hunger. Through it all, he remains constant. Faithful servants are commended by enduring hardship, enduring hardship. Now we have another set of qualities listed here in verse 6. We need verse 6. Second category, faithful servants are commended by the character of their lives. Get this, this is important. It's not just that he continues that that marks him as faithful, a servant of God. It's not just that he continues. It's possible to continue in the ministry with an entirely wrong mindset, an entirely wrong set of attitudes. In fact, when you go through this kind of hardship that he's just described, if you're not going through that with the right kind of character, what does it do to you? It can make you weary of doing well. Don't grow weary in well-doing, the Bible says. It can make you weary. It can make you lukewarm. It can even make you bitter. It can begin to, to weigh into your motives so that now you do what you do out of a sense of duty because you have to. Now, what makes him striking as a servant of God is not just that he continues, but it's the character with which he continues. And notice what his character was marked by. Verse 6, by purity, this man walked in holiness. This man, you could look at the pattern of his life, not the perfection of his life, the pattern of his life, it was purity. He put away sin. He battled sin around him and in himself. He walked in holiness. He was marked by knowledge, verse 6. That is, he, he lived his life by the standard of truth. 
Truth reigned in Paul's life. Watch his life even in the midst of all the hardships and you saw a man who lived according to the standard of God's word. His life, his character is marked by patience and that particular word is normally used to speak of patience with people, tolerance for people. This can be a great test when you're emotionally assaulted as Paul was even at the hands of the Corinthian church. How are you going to respond to that, Paul? How are you going to to deal with that, not only in terms of in your own person, but as you now speak words and write words and deal with these churches? What are we going to see in you when you're hurt? What are we going to see in you when you're mistreated? What you saw in Paul was he committed himself by patience, consistent tolerance, even in the face of the sins of others. He was marked by kindness. He was marked by the Holy Spirit. This is not some fleshly willpower sort of thing you're seeing in Paul. No, this is the product, the result of the fact that he's indwelt by the Spirit and he's yielded to the Spirit's leadership in his life. He submits to the Word of God, which is to say he submits to the Spirit of God and therefore the fruit of his life speaks of the Spirit's presence. Verse 6, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, I love this, genuine love, literally love without hypocrisy, unhypocritical love. He didn't wear the mask of pastor. He didn't wear the mask of love. It was real in his life. He loved these churches. He cared for these people, set him apart as a genuine servant of God. Verse 7 says in the ESV, by truthful speech, could be translated the word of truth. I think probably what is, what is obviously a servant of God is characterized by truthfulness in his speech. But I think probably what is, what is most, what is foremost here is the thought of he was faithful to Scripture. Faithful to Scripture. And therefore, his life and ministry, it was characterized by the power of God, divine power. What characterized Paul was not his own cleverness, not some sort of shtick that he took on to try to manipulate people. He he trusted God's sovereign work, so he relied on the Word of God. Therefore, what was reflected was the power of God. And in that way, his faithfulness, his, his true identity as a servant of God was manifested. He was marked by fighting the good fight of faith. Into verse 7, it says, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left. I mean, I'm going into battle in a way that honors God, in a way that's right. Not going to put an obstacle in anybody's way. That's what I've committed to in my own mind and heart. As a servant of God, I never want to be an obstacle to the gospel. I want to be a commendation to the gospel, and I'm going to commend the gospel by the way that I live. That means I will endure hardship. That means that my character has to be right as I endure hardship. And in this way, he's just giving voice to what characterizes all true servants of God. This is the standard, dear ones, for all of us. But notice the third way we can categorize what he is describing, and that is faithful servants are commended by trusting God through all kinds of treatment. There is the continuance, right, the endurance. This is the foremost thing, great endurance. Explained by character, The the character produced by the Spirit of God is on display as they continue. But how does one experience this character? Answer, by faith. It, It is as we trust God that the character of God's Son is experienced and built into our lives. The Spirit of God produces His work in us as we believe God And therefore, the endurance takes place. But it all rests on faith, trusting God. Because notice now what he says, faithful servants of God continue in the face of. 
and what they think about as they do it. Look at verse 8. Through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise. Let's stop there. This is sort of like the spectrum. What can you ex expect to experience in the ministry? What can you, Christian, expect to experience in the world? Well, there's, there's like this spectrum, right? It can run all the way from honor, people love you, respect you, honor you for the things you believe, to dishonor. It can run from praise. People speak well of you and they rejoice in your presence and they praise you for what you stand for all the way to slander. And there are varying degrees all the way along the way. From honor to dishonor, from praise to slander. Looks like this kind of treatment. Look at the end of verse 8. We are treated as imposters and yet are true, as unknown, and yet well-known, as dying, and behold, we live, as punished, and yet not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, yet possessing everything. Do you know what he's doing there? He's giving us the contrast between what he has actually experienced, but what he has known to be true every step of the way. Because he believes the gospel, because he trusts his Savior, because he knows the truth is according to the word of God, not according to his circumstances. It is by faith that he lives this out. So that when he is being treated as an imposter, he knows that God knows that he's true. And therefore, by the standard of the gospel, he knows that he is true. When he's being treated as an unknown, a, a nobody, someone who is dismissed what, what is your purpose in the world? What do you have to say? Well, he understands that he is well known in terms of the God of heaven, in terms of the one who's called him to do what he's doing. He, he's doing what his master has sent him into the world to do. The Lord knows his steps. The Lord knows where he's at. The Lord knows his service. As dying, as dying, always under the sentence of death, seemingly always on the brink of death, threatened with death. I love this. And look, behold, we live. We live. You see, my life, he's saying, is in the hands of God. Under the threat of death, but we're still here because my life is in the hand of God. He says, as punished, disciplined by those who think he's in the wrong. And yet he says, not killed, not executed. They don't control his lifespan. They don't control the lifespan of his ministry. He is indestructible until the Lord is finished with him. He's eventually going to lose his life in the ministry. But until that day, there's no human court that can take his life. His life is not in their hands. His life is in the Lord's hands. He does know what it is to have a heavy heart. Verse 10, as sorrowful. He does know seasons of discouragement. I warn you, you, you will, in the, in the way of serving Christ, you will know seasons of discouragement. But if, as you go on believing the truth, you can also say along with Paul, yet always rejoicing. You're going to meet with things that, really, that should make you sorrowful, do make you sorrowful, yet you know a joy that is independent of circumstances that can exist in the face of anything because it's not resting on your circumstances. It's resting on the truth. He says that from the world's point of view, he's poor, regarded as poor, but has the great privilege of conveying the riches of God to human souls, yet making many rich. You could get to, to the end of a life like this, a man who ends up dying 
after being in prison, executed after being in prison, in prison many times, beaten many times, shipwrecked, and all the rest that he goes on to describe about himself in the New Testament. You could look at a man like that, into verse 10, and conclude he has nothing. His life has, I mean, you could even think for a moment, his life resulted in nothing, even his ministry. You read the book of 2 Timothy, and it looks like everyone has abandoned him. Where are these believers? Where are these churches? Where are these people? Paul, was your ministry for nothing? He says in verse 10, yet possessing everything. I'm not bankrupt. I have everything in Jesus Christ. You see, you look at the man's continuance, you look at his endurance, and the explanation is character because he endured in a certain kind of way with a certain kind of character. You look at his character and you say, where does that come from? The answer is it comes from salvation. And what has salvation resulted in but faith? And what does faith mean? It means that no matter what is going on around him and in his life, he knows the truth. And he lives his life by the standard of the truth. This is the life of the servant of God, striving with God for the souls of men and women, enduring whatever comes your way in that quest, continuing in that endurance with the character that is produced by the Spirit of God, and holding to that endurance in a spirit of faith. What God says, not what the world says, determines how you view everything. That's the life of the servant of God. Can I ask you tonight, brothers and sisters, isn't that your heart's desire to live that standard? So would you say amen? Isn't that your heart's desire? And isn't it good news to know that the Lord if you know Christ, He has not only saved you, but He has given you everything you need for life and godliness. This is the standard He is at work producing in you. Over time, through all the troubles and all the trials and all the temptations and all the rest, the perfection of these things is where you're headed when one day you're going to be conformed to the image of your Savior. But until that day... This is the goal. This is the ambition. This is the desire. We need, to, we need to say along with the Apostle Paul, God forbid that my life would stand as an obstacle to someone coming to faith in Christ. I don't want my life to be a contradiction. I want my life to be a commendation of the truth as it is in Jesus. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, Lord, I know that this is the desire of every brother and sister in this church. You have saved us and you have given us, as a result, a love for you and a love for souls. Your love has been spread abroad in our hearts by your Spirit who lives in us. So that, Lord, we draw back with the thought that we would be a stumbling block. It would grieve us greatly. Lord, we desire to be faithful servants of yours. We conclude, according to gospel logic, that Christ died for us, not that we would go on living for ourselves, but now we live for Him. And so, Lord, strengthen us to be faithful to that standard at all times, in all of our ways, by Your grace and the power and strength that Your Spirit provides. Bless us, Lord, to the heart of Your people in a way that challenges us, but also in a way that encourages us. Lord, this is your plan for us. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let's stand together.